So going back to your research, what is a good solid example of an organization that did it right, that succeeded, that have been meeting expectations or have already met some key expectations, met some key milestones and, and why? Why did it turn out that way for them? Yes. So given that the digital transformation trend is still ongoing at high speed, I think the, I still believe we are yet to see something where you could say, look, they've went through a 10 year journey and uh, it's now at a successful conclusion. Um, I think that's, that's what I tell my students when I teach in, in business school, I tell them, look, you might live in a much bad, better world for many reasons. Um, you have all these great technologies and so on, but I, I can tell you, you will be older much faster than I, I got older just because there's almost no time to relax anymore. Mm -hmm. So you cannot say I start my transformation and if I make it, if I'm one of the 40%, whatever the real number is who make it, then I've won, but that's never true. Usually already in the last third of while you're still running towards the original goal, or even before you need to restart and do something new. So that's saying, you cannot say, look, these are the five companies who've succeeded. And there's, there's so much research, you know, saying the, the traits of successful companies, there are many books written and, um, there will be books I'm sure where Nokia was one of the companies who succeeded based on that research and we all know what happened, you know? So that's why it's very hard. I think the, what are the characteristics? And that's also the story of a company which is succeeding. So number one, starting the company I talk about, they started really reconsidering their overall strategy, not their technology portfolio, not any digital buzzwords, but saying, look, we look into the crystal ball of the future. No one can really know the future, but if we want to build a company, which will still be successful when we all retire, what does it have to look like? What kind of um, product portfolio does it need to have? What kind of time to market characteristics for changes does it need to have? And the hint is very short cycles. So all these, all these characteristics of what do you have to say about what is your future strategy? How do you want to be? That's what the company did. They chose a customer centric approach, which I, I always have some doubts when people and companies say we want to be customer centric. You know, there is, um, this favorite saying, um, it, it's a quote from Roger Martin, um, that, uh, the opposite thing, if, if the opposite of your strategy is dump in your face, probably so is your strategy. What, what does it mean? Um, if you say, I want to be a cu the most customer friendly company in your strategy, what's the opposite? You hate your customers. So being the most customer friendly is not really a strategy, but they did a strategy, a good one. I cannot go into too much detail. It had customer centricity in it, but it had also had elements, which everyone was believing no one could copy. Um, and then it went along the whole framework, which I also have in my book. So it looked into all the catalysts, which is not technology is one, but it's not only about technology. Mm -hmm. it's, it looked into all the skill dimensions. So if we, if we want to build this company, what kind of people do we need? How long do we need to make, the, get these people on board? And if we cannot get them on board, can we reskill our current employees because they are just not enough digital native design thinking, whatever you believe you need. Um, otherwise you lose your core people. What, what do we need to believe to be true that our customers want? Also interesting. Um, I, I come from my, my first, when I first started working, I was helping to launch mobile operators. So really among the first five starting until you really had customers at scale on board. And we talked a lot more to, to potential customers to understand what they really need. And these days with all the digital research, internet, etc., very often people tend to forget 
what customers really want and what really makes a difference. So that they did that. They did in-depth customer research. They, they really put the team into the shoes of customers. It's a funny thing how it changes your experience or your beliefs when you suddenly become a customer of your own company and all the frustrations you see. And in the end, then it's not about the price or the fancy product. It's about that when you click on this hellish front end in the web shop, um, that when you click, it, it's, uh, it's the screen is jumping and the final click is somewhere hidden where you cannot see it or you get the same letter three times and you have to sign it, even though it said, you know, all these little things. So they, sure. they, they covered that dimension. And linking that, all these catalysts then together with a strategy that only that allowed then to put requirements on paper where you could actually ask someone to develop a platform or the platforms for winning. And then they thought a lot about, so where do we start? As I said before, do we start at the frontier? Do we start in the adjacencies or at the core? In these kind of companies, the core can be your main brand, you know, um, the, the frontier can be some tiny little, no one cares if it's failing brand. Um, so they decided to start more at the frontier brands, but the idea always was whatever we built at the frontier in terms of functionalities of the platform needs to prove that it can be reused at the point of time when we start changing the core. Hmm. So a process, a customer acquisition process, or if you have a, a web shop elements that if you want to use it for a different brand, you don't need to rebuild. You can just repaint it in non-technical terms. Probably you can explain much better what, what needs to be done, but this modular approach needs to be there. And Tim, then, what yes. you just described, sorry to interrupt, I, I would just would like to ask what you just described about having um, products at the frontier prove themselves before they're brought in to form part of the core business. Can you, do you have an example, just a random example of a product or a service, something that a company may have put out at the frontier and that went through that process of providing evidence of its um, uh, you know, I think, justification. I think a very simple example is enabling new payment options. You know, it's like mm -hmm. if you come from a traditional world where you had the classical, you can pay in, in the shop or in the retail, um, you can pay by your bank account, maybe you can pay by credit card. Um, and then what do you do now in this world of today where there's so many more, you know, there's, uh, there's PayPal, there's Amazon Pay, and all these kind of things, which you can either try to squeeze into your existing structures, or you can say, I develop once a multi-pay enabled checkout process, you know, in, in my shop where my products can be, can be bought. Mm -hmm. And this I can copy then for every future product I will ever do. Mm -hmm. And then all the processes, not just all, from the payment down to back to all the core platforms, that's then reusable. And I think that's where, otherwise you just in any multi-product world, just uh, redoing all these things again and again, that's just not efficient, but it needs to be pre-planned. So, mm -hmm. so as I said, the test that's coming back to the first story, the failure, just on a different level, the test has to be. If I decide to start at the frontier, what I will do at the frontier, can it be transferred back to the core or do, or is it just for the frontier? So they did that, which was a good thing. Then they carefully considered the next part of the, of the framework in my book, the process. Mm -hmm. Um, they, it's, are you going agile? Um, are you sticking to traditional waterfall mechanisms or are you using a hybrid approach? Reality is often hybrid um, because pure agile works extremely well in software development, but not in long, long, long term transformations. It's working at the frontier. You can always get agile teams, etc. if it's a small team size. But in this case, let's think about thousands of people thousands of developers working in parallel 
just imagine what this would do if that would be fully agile. You will never end up into anything useful. So it needs to be hybrid. There needs to be a framework, a roadmap. Mm -hmm. um, and within that roadmap and within the strategy developed, things can develop, but you need to have a very tight control. Because otherwise, when then deadlines come up, when then the pressure from the waterfall comes saying, I want to see this product launched, then the agile team start being very agile, finding solutions, which is good. But what they won't do is ensuring this transferability. They would just make it work at the frontier. They don't think about to make it work at the core later, and then everything needs to be redone. Hmm. And then what they also did right is partially right. Um, they started putting measurements mechanisms in place. It was more like counting um, counting the speed, measuring the speed of the agile teams, measuring the spend. Um, and there's still some way to go to, but uh, I think they will get there to really prioritize everything done based on value. What I'm really preaching in my book, um, everything should be prioritized in vis-a-vis -vis the strategy developed and in terms of the value it generates, because always in these programs, you end up at a point in time where someone is saying, Ooh, we are spending so much more than we expected. We need to cut. Right. And that I'm, I'm guaranteeing and promising everyone I talk to, if you're not there yet, this moment will come. So better prepare because the worst thing you can then do is cut the things by guesswork or by beliefs. Better you already had measurements in place where you know which is creating the highest value because it's a portfolio game. You can always say this is, in Germany, you would say um, the gold plating, you know, and we don't mm -hmm. need gold plating. But maybe some gold plating is needed. Going back to what I said before, to, to, to compete in the marketplace. If you don't have something which is better than what competitors have, then why should someone buy your services? So it's not by definition a good idea to kill all gold plating. You need to make sure that when there's gold plating, will someone pay for it? Then you better keep it. Right. Yeah. Right. And that's that's this story, and I think it's, it's still evolving. Um, it's a pain. Um, but I think when you have these elements in place, then you can come to the last part of what my book is talking about, which is this black box in between whatever you do and what your shareholders believe you do. Because no one obviously should be allowed to see the detailed Excel sheet with a business case or whatever is used. Um, no one will ever see it. In the end, a, a shortened um, version of this wrangled many times by investor relation language will go to the earnings calls or to the annual report. And then your shareholders either believe that what you do is creating value or they don't. And the frustration I often see is even when you're extremely successful in your internal business cases, it doesn't really mean that your market will appreciate it mm -hmm. because that's then, and that, I looked into thousands of companies and more than 20,000 annual reports and millions of pages and financials, natural language processing. And the one key learning from all this research is, yeah, it's not really you, that whatever you do guarantees you automatically, the more digital you are, the higher your value becomes. The good thing is on average, digital creates market value. The bad news is there is this, this um, annoying little thing called variance, which means, and I'm, I'm telling the joke every time, you have your, your, your head in the fridge and your feet in the oven, you feel fine, but you're actually dead. <laughs> okay, so, and that, that's what happens. So you need, you have many losers and you have winners and they create this average. And the variance depends very much of, on what kind of company you are, your financials, your industry, 
how you communicate. Um, I try to measure how your sentiment in your talk, when you talk to your shareholders, how that is affecting your market cap. When you talk about digital, is it, it's a difference if you'd say digital is disrupting our market and all these, all this negative language, or where you're saying there is opportunity for us. We have a strategy where we will use digital in a way which will help us win against competition. That's a very different story. And that's how the company I think about is now changing and how they change their messaging and they've learned. And their culture. Yes. They have to see things in with a new mindset. Yes. So what, if you, if we talk 10 years down the line, will we still say these stories, the failure we know, but you could argue then the failure has led to great success because it, it changed the mindset of how things are approached. So probably it was a failure worth having. You could also say that the, the success I've just told was giving some calm for some time in the market, but then they fail to retransform again because there's never any, any relaxation until you retire in this business anymore. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the great fun of it. There's, there will, yeah, there will be winners and losers, but it, it can quickly change. And if there's one common theme, I would say I've seen for, for people and companies being better off. These are the ones who think end to end from strategy towards how they, how shareholders see what they do in terms of value. Hmm. One last question that yes. was very, very helpful and valuable. I have one last question in relation to that. So <clears throat> following that advice and starting with that strategic view from the beginning, um, even when being that prepared and having the right mindset, um, preparing your organizational culture for the changes, trying to do everything right there, because it's a long journey, there are still, um, there are still unexpected things that can happen. Competitors come out of nowhere mm. to, to disrupt your plans or, or beat you to the market or, your executive management may move to another company, maybe they're poached, what, what not. So there, there's always the risk of the unexpected happening, which, which even for the best prepared organization could possibly derail their efforts. Yes. So that's just a fact of life. It's a fact in any business. Is there something that you can also advise organizations to be prepared for the unexpected or, or, or not? Is it not realistic to have additional safeguards or additional practices in place that further shape your plan so that not only is it a solid plan when things go as planned, but it's also a relatively solid plan when unexpected change may occur? I think that's a, it's a great question. And I strongly believe, you know, many people I've heard so many times the times of strategy are over. It's all too dynamic. It doesn't make sense to have a plan because anyway, as you said, three months later, something unexpected will happen and it's all true. But my conclusion would be, and that's also my recommendation, actually the opposite. It now more than ever, you need to have a team and the right strategists in, in place who do not need five years to develop a strategy, but who can, can see what's happening in the market and who can readjust quickly. And the, the plan I was talking about, it's, it's not a plan in the classical sense in terms of, I know for the next five years, what I'm going to do. It's saying, look, I have a strategy to win in the marketplace based on the best information at this point in time. I have a transformation program underlying this who will help me to make this strategy come true. But if I see things changing, I'm also able to quickly adopt and reconsider. And um, this ability, and I always say, look, um, thinking has never been more important and strategizing has never been more important. 
just because, as you said, things are changing so quickly. It doesn't mean you should stop it. It means you should do it quicker and be prepared to do it every time something new happens and then adjust. And that's the only advice I can give, given that, as I said, what I'm telling my students, um, welcome to an interesting world. May your life be interesting. I think this some philosopher said, I think it's, it's not a curse. Um, <laughs> um, it's exhausting, but it's something we should all be aware of. And every company who has the right strategy capabilities in place, it doesn't mean a strategy team, it, the executives need to have these capabilities. They can then adjust and they need to watch. They cannot go heads down. I'm in my transformation. You need to keep your eyes open all the time of what is happening because otherwise you end up five years transforming and then, then you sit, stay on the red carpet where you say, look, we are celebrating our great success. And then someone tells you, but, but did you know that your competitor has been three years faster and has done something exactly opposite and your customers love them? Then celebration is quickly over. Right. Right. Mm. So responsiveness. Yes. And in essence, an attitude whereby we embrace the volatility yes. of, of this new digital market space. Yes. Um, so that it's, it's a, it's something that we accept right from the beginning. And then we're not caught as much by surprise. We can put into action any responsive measures we may have planned for or discussed. And then it doesn't, you know, it's not a big shock. It's yes. yeah, it's part of the volatile nature of where we are now. And it, it, it and it requires, I think that's 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 key, that executives need to be deep in technology, not not like being able to code in Python or whatever. Um, but then, if if you believe that technology is a tool for you to win in the marketplace, you better understand these technologies and not not only stand alone, but how can they act in combination mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, then you need to watch out what's coming you need to educate yourselves on a constant basis you probably need to replace part of your board so that they are more educated and can help you and um, to understand what's out there because otherwise you're so heads down in whatever you're doing you never see it coming yeah i, I fully agree i've mm -hmm. i've um experienced the same thing where leaders, business leaders who don't have, or who don't want to um, gain a deeper knowledge of the technology, they, they they really inhibit themselves and they put the company at risk um, by doing so. So I, I think that's a very wise message and something that um, organizations really have to assess how digitally competent is yeah. the leadership. And, um, and perhaps make changes if it isn't. Uh, Tim, I know I've taken up more of your time. I know it's late for you. Um, thank you so much for your insights. It's really, really beneficial for many to learn about this and to, um, to gain value from all the research you did for your book. Um, Dr. Tim Botke's book is Digital Transformation Payday, a Wall Street Journal best-selling book published by Wiley. Um, Tim, thanks again for joining us today. Thank you very much for the invitation.